Good. So uh, I wish to thank you again, the organizers, for um, letting me present my work at this workshop. Um, this, uh, this talk uh, concerns fi uh, Richard Feynman's uh, uh, contribution to gravitational waves. As we know, gravitational waves are now like a new sense for us to, to sense the cosmos. For example, they allow to hear something that we are blind to, like black holes. But their history, as we all know, was very long and very, very difficult because um, there, was, there were lack of experiments for a long time. Uh, I've done this work in collaboration with Salvatore uh, and Adele Naddeo, with, with, uh, with, uh, with whom I share an interest in Feynman's physics since um, uh, many years. So a brief outline, we will talk about Feynman's uh, involvement in gravity in general. Then we will specialize to gravitational wave. We will give a very, very brief and incomplete history of gravitational waves to set the context, and especially to, to list the main conceptual issues with, with, with which uh, Feynman dealt. Then we will talk about the Chapel Hill Conference, in which Feynman gave his first contributions to gravitational waves. Then we will analyze a letter to Weisskopf, in which he, he made very detailed computation, and in which he to call the conclusions about uh, this subject. And so we will see how Feynman answered to the, the conceptual questions about gravitational waves. And then we will give a brief, um, a brief uh, glimpse of what came uh, later until uh, today. So let us start. Feynman started uh, to be interested in gravitation in the mid 50s. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, these are the main stages of this affair. Uh, he um, gave several contributions. Uh, for example, he introduced the Sikibid argument about which we will talk uh, more later, but he also gave uh, contributions to quantum gravity because he <clears throat> was one of the people who formulated general relativity as a quantum field theory. And this was the basis of his, of his approach to quantum gravity and, with, and um, uh, about which he gave some uh, contribution, for example, the existence of ghosts and tree theorem, but he also gave some contributions to astrophysics because he could uh, prove that hypermassive stars were unstable uh, because of general relativity. And this uh, fact was also proved by Chandrasekhar later. We will not talk about all this stuff, of course, because there is no time. We will uh, concentrate on these three, um, these three parts because these are the, these are the, the places where Feynman uh, concentrated on gravitational waves, which, is, which are our subject. So we'll talk about Shapley Conference, the letter to Weisskopf, and about part of the lectures on gravitation with Feynman, uh, which Feynman gave at Caltech in 1962-63, which were also published as a book uh, many years later. So um, just, um, <clears throat> just as a curiosity, we, we, may, we may see that Feynman uh, became interested in, uh, in gravity just after uh, taming quantum electrodynamics. In fact, uh, already at, in, in the mid 50s, Gelman uh, uh, tells us that Feynman had already made considerable progress, which means that he had been working on gravity maybe for years already. And this is confirmed by, by Bryce DeWitt, uh, which in a letter to Agnev Banson, in which he wanted, he wanted to, to motivate Feynman's invitation to Chapel Hill, say that he had uh, been working on gravity uh, since uh, several years. So let us uh, tell something about Chapel Hill Conference, which was organized, as I said, by Bryce DeWitt and his wife, Cecil DeWitt. The, the point of the, this gravitation was to contextualize uh, general relativity in, uh, in physics uh, at large. And uh, the main points were classical gravity with gravitational waves, quantum gravity, and uh, uh, also important, uh, why gravity should be quantized, because it was not obvious at all. Feynman was invited because, as we, say, as we saw, he had worked on gravity since many years, and he shared the main concerns of the organizers. So he said the problem of the relation of gravitation to the rest of physics is one of the outstanding theoretical problems of our age. Um, this conference can be um, contextualized in the, in, the, in the larger context, which is the renaissance of general relativity, which is the period starting precisely in the mid 50s and uh, lasting about 15 years in which uh, General relativity began, uh, began to be recognized as a discipline uh, in, on its own, but also connected with the rest of physics, in which it begins to be studied on it for its own sake and not um, just uh, uh, as a starting point for, uh, for quantization of gravity or unified theories. And uh, physical predictions begin to be extracted by using uh, methods which are, which are uh, genuinely uh, general relativistic and not, uh, not relying on intuition coming from pre relativistic physics. And one of the first problems to be tackled by people in, uh, in this period is just gravitational radiation. So 
this is our context. Um, and uh, for, for what concerns us, uh, this is a very brief history of gravitational waves until the period we are working, uh, we are talking about. Since uh, 1916 and 1918, where Einstein uh, first found uh, a wave solution to general relativity in the linearized approximation, there were several important steps, for example, Eddington and Eisen Rosen. But for us, the important one is the one in 1956 when uh, uh, Pirani characterized the gravitational radiation in uh, an event fashion that is uh, in a way which was coherent under general coordinate transformation. And uh, this set the stage for Feynman's contribution and for also for detection of gravitational uh, waves much later. And then we have the Chapel Hill uh, Conference in 1957. So, <clears throat> what, which were the problems with gravitational waves in 1957? Of course, this problem were completely theoretical because of, there was there was no experiment whatsoever at the time, even if the, if uh, already 40 years had passed since the, um, their um, theoretical um, prediction. The first question was was actually, do do they really exist or are, or are they just uh, artifacts about, uh, of a coordinate? Because general relativity is a, gen a generally coherent theory. So it is not clear at all if, if when you see something, it is real or it is just uh, because you chose the wrong coordinates. Do, <clears throat> can these gravitational waves do work? Do they carry energy? Do they move with the speed of light? Also, do they, do, uh, are they properties of the full theory, the full nonlinear theory, or just of the approximation we used? And uh, related to this, do binary stars emit gravitational radiation? This is not obvious at all because uh, binary stars are self-gravitating systems and they are not included in the linear approximation. And if they do radiate, uh, does the quadrupole formula which was derived by Einstein give it the right results or does it not, or is it needed something more complex? Feynman, with its contribution, gave his own answers to these questions, even if not, uh, it, it, it may be seen that maybe he was a bit in a hurry to, to give this answer, but let us uh, go in order. Mm. At Chapel Hill, Feynman, um, starting from Pirani's uh, uh, characterization of gravitational waves in terms of the Riemann tensor, which, which is an, an, an invariant concept, and uh, in terms of the geodesic deviation equation in which Pirani uh, showed that the gravitational waves make the proper distance between a couple of test masses vary, he proposed that maybe these masses can be attached to some rod with friction, and they, in this way, the friction will heat up uh, the rod and uh, can extract work on uh, extract work from the gravitational waves, which then are proved to carry energy. He says, in fact, my instincts is that if, if you can feel it, you can make it. In fact, he, he could actually try to feel the gravitational wave to, to make uh, this work. So, um, connected to this, after uh, the discussing this uh, device, he considered a possible gravitational wave detector in which there are four test masses which move, uh, um, which, which oscillate in this, uh, in this way that is shown here. And, uh, uh, he uses this gravitational wave detector to compute how much energy the gravitational wave can um, can uh, can uh, carry because uh, uh, if this this ma these masses uh, oscillate they gen they um, because of a gravitational wave they generate a secondary gravitational wave which interferes with the first and carries energy away and this energy which is taken away is exactly the uh, the energy uh, carried by the gravitational wave. And he also says a very interesting thing. He says that since this is a solution of the equation, even if the equation is approximated, this can be made. So there should be some experiment one day that can make um, this wave. And he concludes that these waves are real and they can be generated because his device not only uh, detected gravitational waves, at least theoretical, but he could do, it could also generate them. But uh, after that, he... Um, also presented the result of a computation. He did. This shows that before Chevrolet, he had already done quite a lot of computations. In fact, he could prove, he could, he could, um, he could uh, derive a formula which uh, um, described the energy loss in a binary star system, which means that he believed that binary stars did generate gravitational radiation. He also estimated um, the magnitude of this effect in the, ca in the case of the Sun-Earth system. Of course, this is very, very, very small, but at least he could make a very definite prediction. But there, in the proceeding of the Chapel Hill conference, there is no uh, mention of the, the steps, the computations that he uh, performed to arrive to this uh, result. And uh, 
He, so uh, these uh, computations are found in the letters, in the letters that Feynman wrote to Weisskopf uh, in uh, the beginning of 1961 as the response to a question that uh, Weisskopf had asked Feynman in 1960. And some of these materials is also included in the Caltech lectures. And what is very interesting about this lecture is that uh, <clears throat> Feynman performs his computation about the gravitational waves first from a quantum point of view and then from for a classical point of view. I mentioned before that for Feynman, gravity was nothing but, uh, but another quantum field theory. So this was his point of view. In fact, he says that he was studying actually the problem of quantization of Einstein's relativity. After a couple of years, he would give his contribution to quantum gravity, the ghosts, and so on. So this letter comes into this context. He just uh, uh, performed the computation without radiation corrections, which means without loop corrections, so in, uh, in the classical limit, essentially. And uh, in fact, he says that this view is quantum mechanical, but the classical limits are easily derived. So what does he do in this letter? First of all, he, just, he justifies the linearized approximation. We saw that people were skeptic about the fact that the gravitational waves really existed, and uh, the people thought that maybe there were artifacts of linearized approximation. Instead, Feynman said, no. For me, it is obvious that we have to use um, uh, linearized approximation in perturbation theory. This is the, actually the best context at all in which we can use these techniques, because gravity is very, very weak. So if we cannot use it here, where can we use it? So. Um, the linear approximation is, ju is just is fully justified by the weakness of uh, gravity. There is no need to, uh, to, apolog to apologize for, because we want to use perturbation theory. So after that, he considers uh, a quantum field theory made by linearized gravity that is a, a massless spin-2 field covered with a scalar matter. And he computes the three-level emission of a graviton uh, in several scattering and decay experiments in the low energy limit. That is, is just considering what is uh, what uh, may be called gravitational Bremsstrahlung, and um, he uh, gives an, an expression for probability of graviton emission, and uh, he shows we, we, that this uh, this um, this expression is universal in the low energy limit. It means that the result is independent of the spin of the particles which are interacting. So the fact that you use a scalar matter and not, for example, the spin one half matter, is not uh, relevant at all. But the most important part is that. If there is an interaction, there is graviton emission in this interaction, this graviton emission is independent of, of, the, of the interaction. So if this scattering is gravitational, graviton emission is there. So also if mass is interact gravitation gravitationally, there is graviton emission. And for him, this is a proof that uh, self-gravitating system can emit gravi gravitons and hence uh, gravitational radiation. In fact, he said, uh, Shift asked me if two masses under the mutual gravitation can radiate. The answer is yes, they can. And the exact nature of the overall scattering process is not important. Here, he is very critical about people who do not believe that self-gravitation uh, systems, uh, self-gravitating system can radiate. He uh, says there is no basis for this claim. There are some theorists who go about mumbling some mystical reason to claim that uh, radiation would not occur. So for him, it's just uh, nonsense. Uh, gra uh, gravitating system must emit gravitational radiation. Then he switches to a classical computation, which is quite standard, uh, actually. He just uh, solves, uh, as, as, as Einstein did, the inhomogeneous wave equation uh, for linearized gravity. He approximates uh, uh, for large, large distances, large wavelength, and uh, the, he makes the post newtonian approximation. And he derives, like Einstein did, the quadruple formula. What is interesting about this is that um, he used a very clever trick to compute the energy density. Um, carried by gravitational waves without getting messed up with the uh, strange things like uh, energy momentum pseudotensors or, uh, or the like, like for example, other people who did this computation before him did. For example, Landa only if did this computation before him, but they, they did it in a, in a more complex way because uh, even if a more rigorous but more complex way, instead here we can see Feynman's uh, cleverness at, uh, at work also in this context. And then he uh, shows that this formula is the same as the, is, is, is agrees with the graviton uh, emission probability computed uh, in the quantum theory, but this is to be expected because the quantum theory at three level is just the classical theory. So the two must uh, agree. And then he computes the energy emission by binary star, uh, getting again the formula, the formula that he had um, uh, obtained at Chapel Hill. And uh, after that, he considers again the detector uh, he considered at Chapel Hill, but this time with all the computations. 
he computes the energy absorbed and uh, the radiation and um, this, this, he, so he can uh, fully compute the energy loss. Uh, this, uh, this computation told him that gravitational waves do exist, they are radiated by binary system, and so he was very, very critical about people who continued uh, to doubt about these things. He, reversed, he criticized them very harshly. For example, he was actually surprised that there was a debate about this, uh, about this, um, this issue and uh, about the fact that gravitational waves take energy. For him, this was obvious. In fact, his answers to the big questions are affirmative. So gravitational waves, waves do exist. They do carry energy because he computed it. They move with the speed of light because they are massless particles in quantum field theory. The, the, we are justified in using linearized approximation because gravity is weak. And it's explicit, explicit computation shows that gra uh, binary stars emit gravitational radiation. So there is no point in continuing this uh, debate. In fact, uh, even if there are no experiments for Feynman, uh, science can go on because uh, there are two ways to, to go on. And the, the one he prefers is to, pre to pretend that experiments uh, are there and make computation just uh, as if there, there were experiments. This is what he did. He pretended that the binary stars emitted gravitational radiation and he computed it as, it, as, as it was measurable. He did not like the rigorous approach, the mathematical approach in which the guide is uh, mathematical rigor. Another thing to, to emphasize is that for Feynman, uh, gravity was just another interaction. It's, it was just like electromagnetic interaction. It was a quantum field theory, which at three level made uh, a classical theory emerge. And the, all the geometrical apparatus that was uh, proper of general relativity was just an accident emerging in the classical limits, even if uh, uh, he was still open to the possibility that, that gravity was not a quantum the theory at all, because at that time it was not really known. And uh, for him, uh, um, this is the, the picture of gravity. This was expressed in the Hughes lectures that he gave in the 60s about uh, also uh, astronomy and astrophysics uh, topics in which he discussed the gravity at length. Um, if we go back to Chapelil, we see that uh, Pirani uh, did not only inspire Feynman to, to, to the sticky bead argument, he also inspired Bondi, which, who, who gave uh, essentially the same argument, but um, without as many implications as Feynman did. He, but, but he thought about uh, putting a dissipative term in the, in the geodesic deviation equation and uh, use this dissipative term to measure the the energy carried by the, gravi the gravitational wave. And all this discussion occurring at Chevalier actually set the stage for what, which were the first really experimental efforts in detecting gravitational waves. As it is, it is uh, well known that Joe Weber was uh, at Chevalier, and after Chevalier, he began his endeavor um, with resonant bars to, to explore gravitational waves. This, uh, this brought about uh, a whole series of uh, very important technological advance and finally paved the way for LIGO and Virgo uh, interferometers. In fact, he says he wants to measure the Riemann tensor, just as Pirani had said, and also as Feynman has said. After that, uh, the, the, apart from the question about the existence of gravitational waves, which was uh, and the energy uh, content, which was considered settled also thanks to Feynman, um, the other questions were still open. In the late 60s and uh, uh, 50s and 60s, there was still um, uh, the, the question about uh, binary systems, even if there were experimental uh, efforts, and also because relativistic astrophysics had gave some, uh, some, some hints about uh, possible gravitational wave sources. In the 70s, finally, gravitational wave searching began a um, uh, big, big science enterprise with the, the constitution of the LIGO collaboration. And also, the first indirect evidence of gravitational radiation was um, from binary neutron stars was given, so proving in, in a definitive way that uh, binary systems do emit radiation. But even then, it was still not, not known whether the quadrupole formula did describe this uh, energy loss. In the, uh, in the end of the 80s, it was finally so that they, uh, it did, so it worked very well. And then after that, the story is well known. In 2015, the, there was the first uh, direct detection by LIGO and the birth of multi-messenger astronomy. That is an astronomy based on both gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. And now these are our answer to the big questions. 
uh, gravitational waves do exist. They do work, of course, because we, we saw them. They move with the speed of light because uh, uh, LIGO and Virgo proved it. They are not artifact of linearized approximation because we have solutions of the Einstein general relativity which describe um, gravitational radiation by uh, localized sources. And then we can use linearized approximation far from the sources because their waves are weak. And we know that binary stars do emit gravitational radiation. In fact, we, didn't ne we never saw uh, gravitational radiation coming not from a binary system. All uh, sources we know are binary systems, even if not of uh, ordinary stars, of course. We are talking about black holes and uh, neutron stars. And we also have confirmation of the validity of quadrupole formula. So to conclude, Feynman was interested in gravity uh, for about 15, 20 years, in the 50s and the 60s. He did not publish much, but he gave several important contributions, in particular to gravitational waves. He um, very early came to, to the conclusions that gravitational waves exist and to how they are generated by binary systems. And he did not share the theoretical concerns of other relativists. In fact, he, um, it is probably because of this that he lost interest in the subject in the 60s, because he felt that with all these doubts, with all these uh, controversies on things that uh, he assumed to be established, there was no real progress, and so he switched to other topics. And then uh, the thought experiments he uh, gave at Chapel Hill helped to, um, to, to settle the question about existence and energy content of gravitational waves. And in all this, uh, in all this contribution, we see uh, several of his um, um, beliefs about uh, science and about physics. First of all, that nature is quantum, even if it's, he was open uh, to alternatives. So gravity is also a manifestation of an underlying quantum theory. And also, um, if experiments are not uh, present, he did not like the rigorous and mathematical way of proceeding. For example, he, would, he did not like string theory for the same reason, while he preferred to pretend that there were experiments and to do computation as if uh, they were. As we saw now, he was right because his uh, conclusions were actually uh, vindicated by experiments. So uh, I thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Marco, for uh, this uh, interesting presentation. Um, we have some, and I thank you also for being perfectly in, in time. We have some uh, questions, I don't see them, so uh, waiting for some uh, some questions. I have one of my of my own for you, Marco. I I I am a, I was aware, of course, of these uh, of Feynman's very early interest and uh, insights in the field of uh, uh, gravitational wave uh, research, but. Uh, what uh, I, I'm not aware if he continued to have some interest. He did not publish uh, anything, but uh, and uh, I'm not aware of any other um, comment or uh, calculation done by him later. Uh, for example, when uh, when uh, Weber. Uh, uh, made his first claims of uh, gravitational wave detection at the end of the 60s and uh, also later when uh, the the binary uh, pulsar by Holtz and Taylor was discovered and then later on observed for several years until in the early 80s finally there was the confirmation of uh, um, of gravitational wave emission, uh, at least uh, an un undirect observation of this emission according to the predictions of general relativity because of the shrinking of the orbital periods of the Hulse and Taylor pulsar. Uh, but I am not aware of, of course, Feynman, I think he had been interested to these results and to these uh, also controversies um, uh, by, by Weber and, and things, uh, scientific controversies in the field, but I'm not aware of any comment, thought, um, and this, I would be interested in knowing if he followed this and if his follow-up in uh, of his interest in gravitational wave research <laughs> well as far as we know um after the letter to weisskopf and the 62 63 lectures at caltech he never touched uh, the topic again there uh, he um 
totally lost interest in gravitation in the end of the 60s because he considered the, the questions to be settled. As I said, he was very upset about people still arguing about, um, about uh, things that he considered to be settled, for example, about uh, the radiation by binary systems. Um, after the 60s, there is probably some, in the, in the Caltech archives, there, is, there are some, um, some notes of Feynman about gravity, but uh, there are mostly coarse notes. I must confess that I did not see them yet, so I, don't, I do not know if he, in uh, those lecture notes, says something about uh, gravitational wa waves, about Weber, about, uh, about um, uh, Hulse Taylor Pulsar and so on. Uh, I, I am, I, I'm, uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, when he, he heard, uh, he heard this, he just said, I knew it. I already knew it, I told you. <laughs> so this is pro probably what he thought. I, I mean, he, he, he had proven in his, uh, in his own way that binary systems do emit gravitational waves and they do it by the quadruple formula. So when the Hulse Taylor pulsar uh, was, uh, was observed to, uh, to emit gravitational waves, uh, even if indirectly, he, I mean, he just, he may have seen this as a confirmation of his computations, but his real, uh, if, if he really said something, if, uh, if there are some comments by him, some records I did not uh, see yet because this is still work in progress actually. So maybe in the next uh, workshop, I will tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. We will be looking forward to, to know, <laughs> to knowing this. Roberto Lalli is asking a question to you. Uh, what do you think was the impact of his uh, of, of Feynman's work with Wheeler uh, uh, for the Wheeler uh, Feynman absorber theory in his approach to gravitation in the 1950s, 60s? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question. Thank you for asking. In fact, uh, this is something I did not mention because uh, I did not have time, but p uh, many people did not, did not believe that uh, binary systems emitted gravitational waves because they did not know actually why in gravity you have to use retarded potential as you do in electromagnetism. There was no evidence, so they thought maybe uh, in gravity you have to use both, uh, gra both retarded and advanced potential, but unlike in electromagnetism where there is the absorber theory, there are absorbers which uh, make uh, sure in, in a sense that uh, the effect is as if there are only retarded waves. In gravity, there is no, um, the, 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 the weakness of the interaction makes this not possible. And so there is no, um, there is no analogous mechanism as uh, Wheeler, Feynman and Sober theory. So there are both retarded and advanced potential, which, which uh, uh, was effect, uh, was a um, overall effect is that uh, uh, binary systems do not emit energy as gravitational waves. Some people even computed this, uh, computed them to gain energy because of, because of, of advanced gravitational waves. But Feynman uh, in all this seemed to, to take no notice. He, he never mentioned uh, advanced potential when he talked about uh, gravitational waves. So he, it, is, uh, it is conceivable, at least to me, that he did not have in mind at all the Wheeler-Feynman absorber theory. Other people did. The, the, the people he actually criticized did think about Wheeler-Feynman absorber theory, but he didn't when talking about gravitational waves. Probably he thought this theory to be completely superseded by the, by the end of 50s and 60s. Thank you, Marco. Oh, you are, you look freezed in this moment, I can... Sorry? Oh, I, 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 you look freezed then, so I didn't hear your voice. Uh, ah. I heard only the last, I, I think you, you had finished, but oh, your sorry, image did, is did, uh, did, did, uh, Roberto, did you hear my answer? And, uh... Yeah, 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 I hear it. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, okay, so, so it was not my problem. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's just the image is freeze, ah. but uh, the voice okay, is okay. Uh, ah, okay, yes, okay. audible. Good, good. It's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, I, I don't see other uh, questions uh, here. It's also an interesting thing, a comment that I, I wish to, to make, if there are no other questions here, is that, of course, Feynman is a, a, a perfect, beautiful example of how um, a, a particle, uh, I mean, uh, he, he's a, 
360 degrees physicist, but uh, um, a person interested in quantum, uh, of course, a person making a great contribution in quantum um, uh, dynamics and uh, in, in uh, nuclear physics and uh, particle physics had um, an impact on a field as gravitational waves, and this is not the first, the only, <laughs> the only case. So it's uh, this transversal uh, trying to bring some uh, um, concepts and calculations from uh, one area of physics to to another area of physics. Uh, this is surely something that is interesting for for our focus in the workshop too. So uh, uh, this is. Uh, it's like an external voice. I mean, he was not a relati uh, relativist in the classical sense. He was not very mathematically inclined. He was not focused on the classical theory, but he, he was he was more of a particle physics, as you said, more of quantum field theories. And he brought this. He was one of the first to bring this point of view in uh, gravitational research. It was completely absent before, and now instead he was he brought it to, to relativists. Yeah, sure. Thank you again, Marco. So, um, 